when you look at the evidence that we have put together, um, one of the things that we have to do is we can, today's technology, there's a word that just floats around all over the place in every legal justice system, and that's DNA evidence. It's the most profound technology that has come about. Uh, people have been released from jail, from DNA evidence. And I'm not going to pretend that I know anything from a scientific or medical aspect of it. But this next brother, who has taken the time to put this together, to track it from a culture, from Israel, across the country, you're going to be surprised where Israel has gone, where we came from, all through DNA evidence. And that's now from our next guest, Brother Ron Dalton, Jr. <laughs> Hebrews to Negroes. Have a seat, my brother. Man, man, man. It don't, this conference don't get no better than this. Exactly, exactly. Wow, wow. Um, let me say, um, you all, this is your first time meeting. I know you all have done some stuff together. This is your first time meeting Brother Ron Dalton in person. You're all the way across. These brothers, yeah. but this is their first time. You all are a part of history. So give yourself a big hand. This is history. You, you, you all are witnessing these brothers meet each other for the first time, although you've seen them on the various networks and platforms, interacting, discussing, sharing, defending, protecting, and all of that. This is the first time that they have met. So um, I'm very fortunate to meet you, Brother Ron. Man, let me tell you, that Hebrews to Negroes film documentary just blew me out of the water. I have not seen the film, the trailers I would watch over and over and over and over and over because mm -hmm. I knew the Most High was going to put me with you. I didn't know how, didn't know when, didn't know where, but I believe that. That's, that's just me. I, I believe that. And so when I was with Brother Benea Israel um, during the conference, he gave me your phone number, and uh, it was like two weeks later. We were at the uh, Great Gathering Hebrew Conference in High Point, North Carolina, and so he was telling me, he said, listen, um, I can put you in contact with him. I said, you can? He says, yeah. So he did. Um, so I thought it was going to be like a um, small conversation, introduction, because I wanted to actually interview him on the platform. Well, what ended up happening, he says, well, you know, I'm going to be in. This was at the, right at the beginning of March. And he says, you know, I'm going to be in South Florida on March the 29th through April something, spring break, family, all like that. And I says, wow. So we talked about him coming to teach to the congregation. We got into the film. And then it just started to roll um, what we had going. And then I said, you're going to come and do that? He says, yeah, I'm going to teach. I said, well, brother, <laughs> you're going to take my main day spot and you're going to teach to the channel. And so he agreed to do that. Um, as soon as I hung up the phone, I was going to call Brother Benea to thank him for giving me the information to let him know that everything had worked out okay. But I had called Brother Iguate, Dr. Amwa, a few weeks ago prior to me speaking to you that day. Right, yeah. He happened to return my phone call as soon as I hung up the phone. 
when I'm in the midst of calling Brother Benea. And I says, he says, hey, Pastor Johnson, I want to apologize. I just got to your um, voicemail. I'm sorry I didn't call you back. Things have been kind of hectic. So he says, um, so I'm sorry. I said, well, guess who I was just on the phone with? I was just on the phone with Brother Ron Dalton, and he's coming to South Florida. He says, really? I says, man, we're going to show the film. He's going to teach. And he says, well, I'm coming. I says, really? He says, I'm coming. And I says, wow. And right after that, I, I says, wow. So I says, well, listen, I'll give you the dates. We're going to get this thing together. So in my mind, I'm thinking, great, another Great Gathering Hebrew Conference. Then I called up Brother Benea, and Brother Benea, I thanked him, and he says, I'm telling him what's going on, and he says, man, I can't get there, Pastor Johnson. I, I got to check with the wife, man, because we had so many things planned. So I'm really, you know, like, come on. So he called me back, and he says, well, I'm there. At that point, I said, it's on. We got a great gathering <laughs> Hebrew conference, right? Mm -hmm. Then when I tell... Brother Ron Shields, he says, I'm there. I just want to come and be a fly on the wall, spectator in the seat. I said, no, this is not going to happen. So I say all that to say this. I'm glad to be able to put you guys together. Um, and this is the first time that we all have met. I have been very fortunate to have met in person, not only just talked to, but these four brothers, Brother Yerushalam. Y'all remember Brother Yerushalam who did? Yeah, I actually met him in person. So I have been very fortunate, and I don't know why, what, what it means to meet not only Brother Yerushalam and these four brothers. I, I'm a very fortunate person as a pastor to have been able to come across you guys and reach. And before I, we put this together, I was sitting, I'm not a prophet, I'm not a prophet. But I was sitting in my uh, lounge chair, and the Almighty, he deals with you in dreams and visions upon your head, according to the book of Job. And he said, this year is going to be one of the greatest awakenings since 2016. Because you talk to a lot of people, 2016, oh, 2016, 2016. This year is going to be it. But this is how I got up, and I said, wow, uh, this is awesome. I don't know what that meant, but I knew the conference that this I was trying to do in October, but it was the most high that did this, that put this together. So I'm very fortunate um, to have done that. And, and thank you, brothers, okay. for what you have done. Um, I've also had the opportunity to meet one of the oldest guys in the movement in the United States, and that's Brother Henry Bowie. And his brother Henry Bowie has one of the most well-organized Hebrew congregations that you can ever imagine. You, if you haven't gone, try to get there on a feast day. The place sits on a conference setting, 10,000 people comfortably under air. So believe me that. Uh, so I've also had the opportunity to meet him as well and just dialogue and he has really helped me learn a lot of things that I thought I knew but watching you all's documentary and what you're doing you have summed up what these brothers have done using the latest technology that cannot be denied courts don't deny it it's the best evidentiary it's the best evidence that anybody will just say, okay, that's it. DNA says it. That's it. Brother, you have done that. Wrote books for, put together a film. Our hats are off to you, and you're very humble. But we thank the Almighty for you in the work that you have done from a DNA evidentiary value. So we thank you for that. No problem, no problem. So... Tell us a little bit about you, and because this started with you. We saved the best, well, all of these guys are the best, but. Uh, 
Well, that, I mean, if anybody hasn't heard my, my whole story, uh, basically I'm the son of a pastor, Pentecostal apostolic pastor uh, in Detroit. Uh, anybody from Detroit uh, should know about Cool JC and Kojic, uh, but Solomon's Temple's on Seven Mile on the east side of Detroit. But, you know, being the son of a pastor, we grew up in the black church. We go to revivals, you go to state meetings, you go to conventions, you go to, you know, vacation Bible school. You're in church all the time. And, and usually, if, if, like my dad has seven kids, I'm the oldest of the seven kids, he usually has you do different things in the church, or, or teaches you to do everything. Yes. So you can read Bible scriptures, you can play the drums, you can sing, you can direct the choir, you can take the offering, you can you know, lead devotion, you can do it all. Uh, but uh, I was always somebody that, that thought about, you know, when, when pastors would say certain things, I would read my scripture and I would ask questions in Bible class that the pastor would be like, well, why are you asking this question? You just, you just show up in the class, you know, we, we need to go at the end of service, not right now, now's not the time, you're throwing us off. And he- They feared you. Yeah, because I, I asked all these, these tough questions and they'd be like, and then they would laugh like, <laughs> you think you know it all? <laughs> you know, and I was just like, well, can you, tell me the, can you tell me the answer? And they wouldn't have the answer. And I say, and I just I said, see, you know, and then, you know, as I got older, and when I went to college, then I, w I wasn't going to church that much because I, I went to Eastern Michigan University, and I would come back home for the, you know, to wash clothes and for the What's weekend. What was your major? Uh, well, I had a lot of majors, but uh, when I, because I didn't know what I wanted to do at first. I had uh, pre-med, but you can't actually major in pre-med, so I found out outside just majoring in biology, and then chemistry, chemistry I didn't do good, and then I majored in computer science, and then that wasn't good for me, and then I majored in psychology. But then I ended up majoring in uh, sports medicine. Okay. Uh, and then graduated with a degree in sports medicine. And then I went to a physician assistant school at Wayne State University. Um, but it wasn't so, until... So we, we have somebody... Can we consider him a subject matter, subject matter expert? All right. Okay. All right. But, um, it, and I believe that that all happened for a reason because uh, it wasn't until I started working... Uh, in the ER in Santa Grace Hospital and in Detroit Receiving Hospital and those two hospitals in Detroit are our are, are level one trauma hospitals mm -hmm. and so when I did my internship work there uh, even at the VA hospital in Detroit you know I would see everything that would happen from the streets so like gunshots to the head gunshots to the eye gunshots to the mouth to the testicle to the butt to the leg to the back to the stomach I and mean, then we used to see all of that uh, just right up and then we had to go into the surgery yeah I mean we I mean the stabs Bottles to the head, everything. We used to see all that, right. and and then we had, you know, we had to answer to the calls on the floor in the ER, then on the main floors, the med surgical floors, the medicine floors, and I just constantly kept seeing, and and this is in, at work, constantly kept seeing the dysfunction and oppression mm. and and just, just destruction of our people, right. uh, and it kept happening, you know, year after year after year, you know, certain times of the year, like summertime, you can expect. Right you know, people to be shot that day. You know, he said, oh, it's going to be a couple of shootings today because it's the summertime. People are going to start wilding out, just like in Chicago. And, you know, I just started wondering, like, well, why are we such a broken, oppressed, destroyed people? Because when I would go home, and even when I would hang out with my friends in Detroit at the clubs and different things like that when I was young, uh, I used to be like, you know, we, as a people, we, we really don't have nothing. We're, we're, we're working for everybody else. And I used to look around and see the Jews and the Arabs and the Indians uh, and the Koreans and everybody else just, just making money, you know, not worrying about nothing, going on vacation, wow. driving Escalade, like extended body trucks, Yukon XLs, and yeah, living yeah. in big mansions. And I used to be like, well, why is this so hard for us? Right. And I said, we, you know, and, some, and a lot of times the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans are Iraqi Christians. And you see Polish, you see a lot of Christians, you say, well, we're praying, we praying to Jesus too, but it seems like we're not getting our prayers answered. Right. And you look in the community, see all these churches, see all these black folk, that are praying every Sunday, you know, after we pray, we go to get something to eat at Poe Folks and, and, and this and that. And and we just and then and then if it's the game is the playoffs is coming on, then you the pastors like I gotta get off so the playoffs. And so you see the same cycle. And then so one day um I had came home from school uh to go to like a, a some kind of like men's day or some kind of thing they had on the weekend, and I came late, I sat in the back of the service, and I was reading the Bible. And, you know, the pastor was preaching, but, you know, I've heard the pastors preach so much that I knew everything they were going to say. So I'm reading through the Bible, and I get to Deuteronomy 28, and when I'm reading it, it just kind of like stuck in my head. And I started thinking to myself, you know, this sounds like us. 
and wow. I'm like reading through the Deuteronomy 28. And all, I had read the Bible front and back many times. Yeah. You know, because my dad would make us do lessons. And but that one particular time when I read it, it you know that you should go into captivity. Your curse shall be a basket in your store. You know your sons and daughters are going to get to all that stuff. And I said, this sounds like us. And, and and so then I started wondering, are we the real children of Israel? And so, you know, I asked my my parents this stuff, and they'd be like, No, Ryan, we're Gentiles. <coughs> you know, you know. And I said, What's a Gentile? And uh, you know, they never read Genesis ten and, and explained us what a Gentile was. We just right, right. we just always taught we're Gentiles. And I said, Well, you know, who is a Gentile? Did no one have a son named Gentile? And they'd be like, You know, Ryan, you know, not right now. <laughs> and um, and so then, you know, so basically. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So, so basically, I just, you know, asked, asked, you know, God, I said, can you show me the truth? And at the same time, around that time, I was, um, I had a friend, he, he, we worked together in Sinai Grace, and we had stumbled upon a book called The Synagogue of Satan. Uh, and I don't know if anybody's read that book by Andrew Carrington Hitchcock. And when I read that book, and me, me and him read that book, we was like, what? He's like, these, these Jewish people are not the real Jews? I said, like, well, who are the real Jews then? And then, he, and then he was like, he looked at me, he's like, that's the big question. So then I was really confused. I asked God to show me the truth uh, one night, and I was really sincere. And then and one thing led to another, and I started studying, and then he started to reveal different things to me. And the thing is, like with me, uh, when I would read something, I would go to a deeper level. I would take it to a deeper level. Okay. And because I wanted to know more. So if I read about a word, and I don't understand that word, I would, I would research that word. And then try to research, uh, is that word something that they were talked about in a 16th, 16th century book or a 17th century book? Or if there's a word that I didn't understand and it was talking about some region in Africa, I would ask some of my friends. I'd say, hey, do you know what this, what this means right here? And depending on who knew the answer, it could be because in Michigan you have Cameroonians, you have Nigerians, you have Ghanaians, you have uh, some people that are Mandingo or Senegalese, Wolof. Uh, Fulani, Hausa, all, all different types. And I would ask him, well, what does this mean? Where is this at? He said, oh, this is the old word for this. You know, because so, I asked one guy, I said, what is Soninke? He said, oh, Soninke is like the old Mandingo. You know, yeah. Mandingo. And, I, and, and uh, I said, oh, okay. And so, you know, so I, I asked a lot of questions. I just suck the information out of people when I, when I meet them. And so usually when I meet people of other nations like Arabs and Indians and, and Native American Indians and whoever I, I, I kind of like give them a homework assignment they don't even know I'm, I'm giving a homework assignment correct, correct. and I'm asking them questions about their language their history their origin uh, their religion and then I just retain all of that and I start to put the pieces together and so when I got all this information and I compiled it I was saving it on my computer I was printing it out I was uh, writing it down I was putting a, a PowerPoint together and uh, when I had all this information and I had a PowerPoint and everything. I said, I asked my, my dad and, and the church leaders, I said, can I present this to the church? And they said, I said, you already had me speak about prostate cancer and all this other stuff. And they were like, uh, they were like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> and so I said, and I was discouraged. I said, I have all this information, this mind-blowing information that, that I know that they would find it mind-blowing too because I found it mind-blowing. Right. And I just felt like I was the only person in the world that knew this information. And, and people thought I was crazy. And then so then... Um, I remember uh, I was, we was at a, uh, it was like during like a barbecue, uh, July 4th, and I was sitting in, in, on the porch in Detroit with my, uh, with my wife and her family, and I told them, I said, I'm going to write a book about all this stuff, because they heard me talking all the time, I was like, Ryan, you're always talking about this secret society, conspiracy, Jews, black, this and that, you know, they're going to get you, they're going to kill you. <laughs> I'm like, and then all the, all the blacks started chiming in too, oh, we can't talk about the Jews, can't talk about Freemasons, I was like, why not, why y'all scared? Right, I right. said, why are black folk always got to be scared all the time? I said, I was like, bop that. You know, I said, I'm writing a book. You know, and so they were like, okay, all right. Because, you know, a lot of, some of these older guys, they, they're Freemasons, you know, these older guys. But, and so I never wrote a book before. And I asked somebody, I said, hey, how do I write a book? Do I just start writing down in a notebook? And they're, like, they're like, no, Ronald, you got to write it in Microsoft Word. You know, it's like you're doing double work. So why would you write a 700-page book on paper and then have to transfer it to Microsoft Word? So I, was, so I just basically sat down and opened up Microsoft Word and just started typing from the brain, from the dome, and just, just, just was in the zone. And then I was just typing, 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 typing. No publisher that I, that I had contacted wanted to take on my, my book. And finally I found a black lady that, that would publish my book. And she says, Ronald, 
she says, um, she said, I published a book, and then, you know, she checked back with me. She said, Ron, um, are you done with your book yet? I said, yeah, I think I'm almost done. And she was like, well, how long is the book? I said, it's a thousand pages. And she's like, wow. she's like, Ron, no, 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 no. She said, black people ain't going to read a thousand pages. <laughs> and so I said, but they need to know this stuff. They, they don't need to get 10 different books, like 10 100-page books, because then what if they read one and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to buy this book and this, this book, because they get discouraged. And so I cut it down to 700, published the first book. Uh, if anybody's read the first book, they know it's about this big. And then I did two and three and four, and I, and I started to do, well, I, I did halfway complete five and six, but then uh, a lot of people said, well, you know, black people don't read no book, you know, you know that, and, and, and they look at TV and, and, and the video and streaming and all this stuff, so I said, well, I said, maybe I need to make a movie, and he was like, are you going to make a movie, this pastor told me this, uh, he said, you going to make a movie? I said, yeah, I'm, wor I'm, I'm working on it really right now, I'm thinking about right, it, right. and so he was like, well, good luck, and Nobody had ever, and, and I googled uh, on Amazon, the only movie I found was Hebrew, the so-called Negro, by Yaya Bandele, okay. and I think he passed away, but he has a, he has a documentary um, that he did, it's on Amazon, that's the only video I saw at the time about the Hebrew Israelites, the other video came out not too long ago was um, Village of Peace, uh, that they did in Demona with, with uh, Martin Stoudemire, yeah, but other than that, all the all the movies that you see on Amazon about the black Jews coming from a Jewish perspective, uh, like Doing Jewish, they're reemerging the Jews of Nigeria. Right. It's always right. done from a Jewish perspective. They claim to be this, they claim to be that, blah, blah, blah. And so I said, no. I said, well, you know, I'm going to do a movie. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. And I don't, I don't know how I'm going to fund it, but I'm going to use my own money and we'll put this movie together. And I didn't have no training, no knowledge, none of that. I just, I just started writing, writing the script. Then I started to uh, go into like, uh, you have like um, Getty, Alamy, Shutterstock, right. iStock, um, Corbis, you know, right. different things that they, they, uh, they have images and videos. And so I would get stuff, cause, cause because I can't physically afford to go to Africa and go to Egypt and go to Arabia and go to different places of the world, I had to like pick pieces of different things. Which on can different, be expensive. It's expensive and it's time consuming because right. you can just click on... Um, like, for instance, if I want something that shows the Homo World Festival and with the God Tribe, you can type in God Tribe or Homo World Festival, and you may get, depending on what site you go to, you might get a couple of images. Cool. And, but if you just get one or two, and he's like, man, yes, I got something. Or if you, if you just uh, Google, uh, say, uh, the, the Togo, because mm -hmm. if, you, if you talk about Togo, then you know any footage from Togo is probably going to be about the Eve people, because mm -hmm. uh, they ain't got a Togo. And so, and so I was able to pick pick pieces of video and pictures, and I, I had to do it in a way that it lined up with the script that I wrote. Okay. Because I wrote the script, then I had to visualize the script, what I wrote, and then pick the images and videos and, and graphs and different things to put it all together like a puzzle and to make it work into a movie. And it took, uh, it took about three years to make because three? the first, yeah, the first yeah. two years of the movie, uh, I was using my own money to, to okay. fund this. And, and whether I was getting laid off, um, or you know my job was cutting me down my hours um, it, it it created slow points and then high points and then it got to the point where uh, right before the reclaiming the throne a conference that we had in August I think 2018 uh, right before I, we, we went there in New Jersey New York one of the doctors I was working for laid me off on he laid me off on the phone it's like don't come back and I was like, wow. man, I was like, how am I going to finish this movie and I need at least $10,000 more to finish the movie? And the funny thing is, like, when I was, when I was driving to New Jersey and New York, uh, and I said this at the, at the thing, and Ethiopia, well, the lady, she says she's an Ethiopian Jew. Mm -hmm. And she called me on, in the car and said, uh, I've been doing a year of sabbatical and I've been praying to my father uh, yeah, and she says, I've been laying for prostate, praying into the, until I get into the spirit. And she says, I have something to tell you. She says, uh, yeah, I told me, or God told me to tell you that not to worry about what you need because you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. uh, don't worry about uh, finances, how you're going to fund what you want to do. Because I know you, we, she was like, I know you do books and everything else. I've been watching you, but you're going to get what you need. And so when we get to the conference, in the conference, uh, is done, and I'm on the way home. Then Dwayne and Nicole. Anybody know Issachar? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Dwayne and Nicole call me and say, you know, we want to help you 
finish the movie. He's like, okay. Ron, what can we do to help you finish this movie? And I said, well, I need about 5000 minimum to $10,000 max to finish this movie. So then they did a, like a GoFundMe, well, like a pitch, like a, a commercial. Correct. And within, and I didn't think the Hebrews were going to come through like this because I have been on the podcast show, I'm always saying support the movie, donate, the Hebrews, go find me Hebrews and Negroes, go find me.com, back to right. Hebrews and Negroes. People were saying, you're begging too much, stop asking for money on the show. People will think like, oh, you just want money, you're just trying to hustle Zion. Right. But they didn't, and, and, and even some Hebrews thought, oh, he's just going to get the money, he's going to run away and, and get, a, get a Range Rover and pay his bills. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so they didn't believe me. So. So when I when Dwayne did that did that video, uh, within like a week, the the Hebrews all rallied up and donated like almost ten thousand dollars. Wow! Within a week. Yep. And so shout out to Dwayne for that. Um, but yeah, and that that helped push the movie to to the end. And then um, I dropped it in Detroit and, and in front of a crowd of four hundred and fifty people. And uh, even the, even the white people that were working behind the concession stand, yeah. uh, when they got off work, they came in and stood there and watched the movie. And it was like, man, this is one of the best independent films I've ever seen. The way wow. you mixed and mastered it, the, the, the volume was is, is perfect. We don't have to we don't have to adjust the volume up and down depending on the scene. Correct. And he was like, it's very interesting. And they were just all in, just looking. Uh, and they they had been off shift. They were just yeah. standing there with their coats on, just looking at everything. Because they ain't never seen a movie like that before played in their movie theater. Right, right. And um and, and so that was that's it. And um, you know, it's streamer now and And you've never been a filmmaker. No. You've mm -hmm. never put together a probably a good home video. No. <laughs> nope. But the Almighty's energy just to do this from putting it on paper, mm -hmm. writing out what you wanted people to what you wanted to convey to people and getting the right clips to mm -hmm. match it. Mm -hmm. And this is what we have. Right, and so when I did the trailer, the last trailer I did, has anybody seen that last the trailer that you talk about? Has anybody seen that trailer? Everybody seen it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that trailer really kind of, uh, like you said, people were watching it over and over again. They were yeah. getting fired up. It would get, even people in Africa were like, I seen your trailer, man. We need this in Africa, yeah. you know, in Jamaica, in different places, Bahama. They were fired up for that trailer. So when the movie came out, you know, people went crazy, and uh, you know, and it's, it's spreading uh, across the world because I because I could see the analytics on right. the on the uh, computer, and so people from Papua New Guinea, from Indonesia, from uh, from Fiji, from Samoa, from China, from Germany, from wow. you know Bermuda, South America, Brazil, all these different places. They're watching the movie, and you have. A lot of good feedback, especially white people that are really uh, coming to understanding that we are the real children of Israel. And some of them actually said in the emails that they broke down and cried at the end of the movie because uh, they all this time they didn't know. And they've been feeling like they've been taught that the white Jews are the real people. But then this movie made it so clear to them that they felt like all these years we've been doing you guys wrong. And now we're understanding now that you are the real children of Israel. Mm. And, and they, 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 they told me he was crying. They feel really bad. Really, really wow. bad. Wow. Uh, and they want to do what they want to know what they can do to help. And uh, of course, you got certain Jews that are angry and they post a lot of negative comments. They go back and forth with people and they're like, you guys are just Hamites. Quit being a culture vulture. You guys are trying to steal our identity. You know, you guys are Europeans and Hamite mix. You know, and so they're really, they're really upset this, 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 this kind of movie is coming out. Because it's all true. It's all true. So, and then so, you know, now the next project that I'm working on is the, is the second movie. Okay. And I, and I think we had the trailer uh, for people to see it if, if, whenever she loads it up. Um, we, so, for the, you have the, the trailer yeah, done for done. the next For the segment. next movie. Yeah. Wow. It, I, she loaded it up. So, wow. Um, so the, are we able to take a look at that? Are we able to take a look at that? Okay. Let's so it's, uh, it's called uh, Hebrews to Negroes Revelation, the Age of Awakening.
and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The sound effects, mm -hmm. uh, awesome, mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. And when is this coming out? Uh, this year. This year. This year around summertime. Like what we're shooting for um, the at the the great Gath or great Hebrew conference, the Hebrews Negroes Mega Conference that we have in July. Yes. Uh, the 11th to the 14th, we're going to premiere it there. Okay. Premiere it in Detroit. Uh, so that movie is basically and to all everybody that see that uh, saw that, uh, of course. I'm, I'm going up against a juggernaut. Uh, and, of course, like he said, uh, Hollywood needs, well, black Hollywood should be, uh, if they've seen the first movie, they should be trying to work with me. If they are into this truth, they understand uh, that it's important that we as African Americans need to know our identity. And, but, you know, I mean, they, they too have to be fed and they have to go through the Jewish Hollywood system. Because every movie that we see today on the TV screen has to go through Jewish distribution. Lionsgate, MGM, Columbia, you know, all these different Universal, Walt Disney Production Studios, Marvel, it all has to go through Jewish distribution. Wow. Otherwise, you can't see it. That's why they, could, they can control what we see. They control the narrative. So they can give you Toy Years a Slave, they can give you Get Out, they can give you Us, and black people are like, oh, that was, that was deep. You know, that was deep. You see that movie, that was deep. You know, but they don't really address the real problem, the real, the real root. You know, it's just entertainment, but uh, the Hebrew Sneakers movie, is hitting it on the, hitting it on the nose, yes. and that movie right that movie right there, Revelation, uh, is gonna because uh, a lot of people uh, once they find out they're real, real Israelites, then some of the questions is well, who are they? Mm. Correct. You know, and and now the the magnifying glass is gonna be shifted on them, Correct. and because for the longest it's, we seem like we have to prove ourselves to them, That's like true. we gotta we gotta debate with the rabbis, we gotta right. debate with the Muslim imams, we gotta prove. 
that, that we're not just making this up. Correct. Uh, but nobody asks them to prove who they are. Yeah. And so they continue to say, uh, I'm Shemitic. The Arabs, the Arabs, the white Arabs will say, we're Shemitic. You know, and then the Jews will say, we're Shemitic. You know, so they're saying that they're from the sons of Shem. Right. But now with that movie, you, they're going to see the proof. They're going to see the proof of where they came yes. from, how they mixed with different uh, children of Japheth, Gog and Magog, Esau, where the Esau hide himself among the right. nations, right. Uh, Sarah the Horite, all types of, and I'm going to bring the same thing with DNA, archaeology, pro archaeological proof, uh, angles of the face, prognathism of the jaw, uh, the eye color, the hair texture, which makes yeah. your hair straight or thick like Chinese people hair. Uh, down to the skin tones, down to the like DNA haplogroups, paternal haplogroups, uh, paternal haplogroups, autosomal haplogroups, uh, certain diseases that the Jews have, right. certain things that African Americans or people that uh, descend or claim to be from Israel, uh, what they have. And so you can kind of di differentiate uh, who are the sons of Ham, who are the sons of Shem or the Israelites, and then by that you can also pinpoint who are the sons of Japheth. Wow. Uh, and people really need to understand. Uh, who is the confederate, who is Gog and Magog, uh, who was the sons of Togomoth, and all these different things we see in Ezekiel and Daniel, uh, Revelations, because if we truly understand who Gog and Magog is, then you can understand why the things are happening to the children of Israel today in Africa, in the Americas, even over the Indonesian government, uh, that they're terrorizing the, the Papua New Guinea people, West yeah. Papua, and uh, the Australian Aborigines, blackbirding, the Pacific Islands, slave trade, the people don't know about that happened. Um, I mean, there's so, much, there's so much history that they've kept from us. Cool. And, and usually if you trace the British and the Germans and the French and the Dutch and the Arabs, uh, you'll see that they, I, I believe that they, they knew who we were or they, it was innately in them, in their DNA, in their bloodline to oppress us. It's like, it's like a, you know, the most says I declare the end from the beginning. So... He knew that he was going to have certain people Absolutely. whip us for our Absolutely. disobedience. So whether he's using the Arabs, the black Arabs, the white Arabs, using our own people, using uh, the sons of Japheth, Gog and Magog, uh, these are our people that have been oppressing the real children of Israel and right. stealing our identity and telling us or telling the uh, people that claim to be Israelites that what you're doing is pagan. You got to stop doing that. Right. Here's the Bible. We're going to Christianize you. And you start to lose your, your heritage. You start to lose your identity. And then they start mixing with you, and okay. then you start to, you know, like Australia, they got a lot of mixed Aborigines, so Correct. it's hard to find a real true blood Aborigines. But, you know, these are all tactics and, and, and different ways that they can hide the truth. Uh, but like in that trailer, it says that uh, everything that is concealed and hidden will be revealed. Wow. And that's, what, that's happening right now on this day. People are being, the truth is coming out, lies are being exposed, and people are getting called out for who they really are. Wow. Yeah. And so the movie we're going to watch tomorrow, you track the migration patterns. I don't want to go into the movie because we're going to watch it tomorrow, but you actually track the global migration patterns mm -hmm. of our people. Mm -hmm. And we've gone into South America, mm -hmm. the Hispanolias, the mm -hmm. Caribbeans, mm -hmm. Jamaica probably first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and just all over yeah wow. because they uh it's in the, the fascinating thing is with the dna you can literally uh track the migration and it tells the story and it also lines up with what the people say uh like if you know about the ashanti fanti wars the the tribal feud they had going on and how yeah. the ashantis and the fantis were sold into slavery to to the, to the islands of the caribbean and then you look at the Igbo slaves, you look at the Eve slaves mm -hmm. uh, that were taken uh, to the Caribbean, and then you look at uh, Coromante, and there's people in Jamaica that, there's three dialects in Jamaica, mm -hmm. and one of them is, is, is like Coromante, and you have the people in Jamaica that can speak the same dialect that are speaking in Ghana. Yeah. And then some people wow. in Guyana and Suriname can understand these people that are speaking a West African dialect. Okay. And you have people in Cuba that are still speaking a dialect that's seen in Sierra Leone, wow. like from the Temne tribe. And, and people have done movies on this. They've done videos on this. You know, people do, saying this stuff. And you, you can see all the types of different cultures in the Jamaican people that, that Ashanti say, I, I can see my culture w with these people. Yes. And, and, and when you do, when you look at the Moravian um, slave records in Antigua and Barbados, because my, my, my mother's side is from Antigua, New York. And so when you look at the slave records, you'll see 
that the highest number of slaves, the highest percentage of slaves in Antigua was the Igbos. The Igbos. Uh, and, and of course the British, you know, British Antigua. And then with the, with the Haiti, you have the Eve people, you also have some of the Akan people, and the Creoles mixed with Taino, Eve, Portuguese, French. And, and all, like what Benaya says, all this stuff ties in to the Spanish Inquisition, the Portuguese Inquisition, the slave trade that happened in West Coast of Africa where the Portuguese had a lot of ports. Right. And even Amina Castle, before, before we call it Amina Castle, was a Portuguese name for it. And just like um, you have like uh, Lagos is the Portuguese word for lake, and that's in Nigeria. They have a Lagos right. in Portugal too. Yeah. And you have Angola, you have Mozambique, you have Brazil, you have Cape Verde, you have Senegal, Gambia region. I mean, it's so even in the Congo, even in the, even in the Congo, there's so much information in the Congo. Yeah. When you read the, the, the manuscripts of Mani Congo or the old uh, Kingdom of Congo, how it stretched to Cameroon all the way to uh, Zaire or uh, uh, Angola, uh, that was a big territory. A lot of, whole lot of Israelites yeah. were in the Congo. And, and a lot of the Congolese people know that they're Israelites. And some of them had actually called me and said that we're from the tribe of Judah. Wow. They told us that, and they and they would they would break it down, and I would, with me because I'm, I like to research and suck their knowledge. Right. Uh, I would say, well, how do you say this in your language? How do you say this? How do you say this? How do you say this? And they would write a whole list, yeah. and I and I compared it to Hebrew. I said, man, this is Hebrew. Wow. And they were like, yeah, this this Kikongo language is yeah. Hebrew, yeah. you know. And so, a lot of people in the Congo were straight up Hebrews, and it's the, it's that. And to me, I don't think it's a coincidence that the transatlantic slave trade happened in the Congo, and the Arabs even went to the Congo to get slaves. Yeah. They, would take a, they would take a whole lot of people out of the Congo. Yeah. And, and, and then you have people like the Zulu and Exosa and the Nguni peoples that say they migrated from the, that Congo region, mm -hmm. and they started breaking off in different tribes and clans and scattering wow. different parts. Um, so the, like the, uh, the Soto people, and, and you have like the Shona tribe, and, and everything like that. Like the, these, a lot of these guys now are waking up. They're yes. seeing the movie. They're seeing what's going on on YouTube. And they are now saying that we're Israelites and then they're, they're putting up their language because like Nelson Mandela is from the tribe of the Exosa tribe. And so you can see in the Exosa language the Hebrew in it. Okay. You can see it. And then you got people now and a lot of people, a lot of people hate me because they say Ryan's just covering the whole globe. He's destroying the 12 tribes chart. He's making the 12 tribes chart seem like we got to start scratching our heads like, wait a minute now. Right. But, uh, but what I'm showing the people is that, that you know, the 12 tribes chart doesn't like talk about Zulu and Zosa. It doesn't talk about the Kikuyu, the Embu, the Maru, and, and the Kisi. It doesn't talk about the, the Amhara, okay. the Eritreans, the Tigrayans. It doesn't talk about them. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't talk about the Ethiopian Jews. Uh, and, you know, and so I like to cover so many different things. And in the movie, I touch on Africa. I touched on the Americas mm -hmm. uh, because there's a lot of interesting uh, research and, and Divine has seen this in regards to old Hebrew, proto-Sinaitic -Sin, proto Hebrew that was found in Australia, found in Yemen, found in Negev, found in Brazil, uh, found in different areas. And if you look at uh, proto-Sinaitic Hebrew, what they call old Hebrew, and you compare it to South Arabian uh, script, uh, it has 22, 22 characters like Hebrew. Right. And you look at the, the Ge'ez uh, script that the Ethiopian Jews use and the Ethiopian Orthodox uh, Church is 22 letters like Aleph Tav, okay. like in Hebrew. And then you can, you can kind of see the similarities. And even when you talk to Eritreans, they'll break down uh, certain things. Like in, like in, I'm going to talk about this in my, in my next book, but every Hebrew... Or oh, like when Rachel, when they were naming the Hebrews, Hebrew boys like Gad and Reuben and mm -hmm. Issachar, um, the woman was doing doing the naming, and okay. because God has this, God has that, and her troops are come all this other stuff. The Eritreans in their language, what that name, what that name uh, says, like Asher or Gad or Issachar or Zebulon um, or Don, it actually means what the mother had said in that scripture when she named that child. Right. Yeah, and so there's a lot of Eritreans. Uh, and it's not a it's kind of it's kind of weird because the Eritreans are also the ones that are migrating to Israel. Okay. But the Israeli government wants them out, and and you know they don't give them citizenship. Uh, but yeah, they have a lot of history that that goes back to Israel and leaving out during the Babylonian uh, uh, siege and and going through uh, Arabia, uh, the the Habasha region, and then crossing over to the Horn of Africa and having to 
battle and get their niche in, in Kush or with the Nubians, the Nilots. And so, in, in, you know, in the movie, you'll see also the Pacific Islands. You'll see Australia, uh, Polynesia. And um, one thing I'm going to say, with this movie, people from Fiji, people okay. from Maori, people from Samoa, people from the Marshall Islands, people from Australia, uh, even Papua New Guinea have contacted me and said that our elders uh, told us that we are the Israelites. Wow. And they'll start telling their story how they got there. Okay. How they went into Egypt and they went to, uh, to, to the Horn of Africa and crossed over to Yemen. And from Yemen they carried the Indian Ocean all the way across to Papua New Guinea. Or they carried, uh, they carried canoes past the Andaman Islands. Some of the people stopped in the Andaman Islands. Right. And a lot of people that don't know, the Andaman Islands is an island below India. Uh, they're really, really dark. And they have DNA that kind of kind of lines them up with people from India and also people from Australia, right. but their DNA is not seen in Africa. So the Andaman Islands, Andaman Islanders, uh, they look like they could be in Africa, but they're dark skinned They're really dark skinned Right. They're, they're like they're like blue black, right. real dark. And you gotta have a you gotta have permission from the Indian government to mm -hmm. go there and mm -hmm. visit them because they'll look at you and they'll start shooting arrows at you, mm -hmm. or you know, and and like that guy, he got killed trying to. Christianize them. Right. You know, they're people you don't mess with because they have they have they've been in that island for so long that to see a white person or see anybody else come over there, they're looking at you like, well, what can I take? You know, this is red, this is shiny. Yeah. Let me get this. But all these people have an origin, and the people in Fiji, some all the Polynesian islands, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, they all have an origin and they all have stories that trace back to Israel. And and what I found interesting is that their DNA also shows that too. Their DNA shows a tracking through from East Africa to Israel, through Yemen, through the Indian Oceans, uh, India, all these different areas. Which shows how they got there. How they got there. Wow. Yep. Yep. Wow. And then you can even you can even with DNA show how the Indians got some of their mongoloid features when they were tracking through Asia. Yeah. Uh, some went up this way, some went down this way, uh, but then you can see the the, the skin tones. Correct. of some of the old Indians. Have anybody seen the old Indians that are dark skinned? Uh, and then you see the ones that are five dollar Indians. Right. But you can look at them and say, well, where do they get these skin tones from? And they all say that they didn't, they didn't you know, they said they, they weren't always here. They got here from somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're still living on the reservations. There's, there's some that are still on the reservations because you have doctors that go live on the reservations that do uh, medical work. And then you have people that are Choctaw or Chataya or Chickasaw or Shawnee or mm -hmm. Hopi, whatever. And so I just kind of like to get everything. I like to study everything to and try to put, put the down. pieces together like, like a Hebrew Indiana Jones, I guess you want to say it. You know, but, <laughs> but, now my, but now my focus is on uh, the, the people that say that they are Jews and they are not. And, 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 and we have to do that because when you bring this to family members, and this is one thing about the purpose of this conference, is not to bring people, not only to bring people together, like what we're doing, but to also uh, substantiate what we know and who we are. So we have had a spectrum of disciplines that have really proved in conjunction with Leviticus, the 26th chapter, and uh, Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter of who we are. So let's give these brothers a big hand. So tomorrow, we're going to be in the morning, we're going to be hearing more from Brother uh, Dr. Amwa and Dr. Dalton. Um, 10 o'clock in the morning, we're going to do a continental <laughs> breakfast. And listen, we starting at 10. In fact, the breakfast uh, is going to be the continental breakfast. A lot of you all have traveled, uh, but we will have a continental breakfast starting at 9.30 to 10 because this brother is going to get started at 10. And then we have a brother that has, I'm not going to even tell you all. Yeah, I should tell them. Um, Minister Michael Norman is in the audience. Stand up, Minister Michael Norman. This brother here uh, is going to perform tomorrow. We got another brother who's got several albums out coming from Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Are you here, brother? 
Amen. Give him a big hand. Romans 10, 14 says, How then should they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how should they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how should they hear without a preacher? It's time to take the truth to the streets.